notably one of the most acclaimed investigative reporters in the country. Your, your standard underachiever. That's blowing off today. Right, right, right. A 40-year veteran of the Boston Globe, he was the paper's former Washington bureau chief and a founding member of its investigative spotlight team, which is the oldest investigative team in the country. He's won more than 25 national and regional awards, including the Pulitzer Prize on three occasions. And he's a graduate of Suffolk Law School in his spare time and lives in Boston. So welcome, thank Steve. Well, thank you for having me on a uh, misty, uh, Gray uh, weekday afternoon, have a great lunch, meet some new friends, um, and talk about uh, this case that has sort of consumed me um, for uh, a long time. The uh, anniversary, when Patty called, asked me if I would come, uh, she had the key to my, to my castle. She somehow knew my daughter, who teaches fourth grade at the, um, at the Deer Hill School. So I, I said, uh, anything you want, Ted Patty, I salute both to, to the mother of my three grandchildren, so <laughs> anything you need. So um, when my book came out, uh, which I have a book, and I, if we have some time at the end, I'll, uh, I'll ha have it for sale. When my book came out, um, I, you know, I spent a whole year laboring on it back in 2015 it came out. I didn't like the bottom uh, subhead. I wanted it to be Boston's last best secret. And, uh, but my publishers being in New York were f said, oh, that's far too parochial. Uh, but uh, the reason I wanted it to be Boston's last be best secret is because Boston matters to me. Having worked for the Globe Spotlight team, helped start it in the early 70s, we, did, we focused on stories that were had more than headlines. They made a difference in uh, how the city worked, improved the uh, government, uh, even improved the church with the clergy abuse scandal that, uh, that we did in, two, in the early 2000s. Um, and that's what I th felt this, this story had, a larger than life issue. It has been now, uh, the, the, the actual theft took place on March 18th, 1990. It has been um, 34 years coming up uh, that this case has uh, been um, been part of our been part of our newspaper headlines. It uh, yet in the 34 years, not a single per, single person has been arrested uh, involving the crime, and nothing has been has been recovered. Uh, understand uh, what you're talking about. This is the largest art theft in world history, single art th uh, theft. Uh, there are three superlatives in that phrase. Uh, one, uh, the, the, in the world. That's beyond Route 3 and even beyond Route 44. It's the world. <laughs> so, uh, um, in um, the history for all time. You know, not just this century and not the 20th century and the 19th. That's for all time. And uh, the most valuable. What we're talking about artwork that is stunning in its importance to art history. Oops. Allow me. There were, uh, this is the, the museum, uh, the front. Uh, it used to be in the old days, I, I think the they used to have, um, Mrs. Gardner was a great Red Sox fan. And uh, your Fenway was built in 1912. This, this building was uh, uh, established, the museum was built in 1903. And um, these paintings, the, the most valuable ones, now valued at probably a half a billion or more, more a billion dollars, included these. This is a picture of she, a picture of she. Uh, the, when I was writing, I spent a lot of time at Boston uh, uh, Public Library, um, and well, I came down one time just to enjoy the sun, and I saw this is a, a statue to uh, artistic achievement in the world. Six, eight artists there. Six of them have their art on display at the uh, Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. Uh, when it opened in 1903, it was the largest collection of artwork 
owned privately in America. And she had done it for what? For, for larger reasons than to show off to her Boston uh, gentry, landed gentry. Uh, she had done it because she had traveled the world over with her husband for the previous 30 or 40 years. When she came to America, uh, came to Boston in 1860, she was a New Yorker. And uh, she married one of our most um, well, well off, well to do, Jack Gardner uh, entrepreneurs. He had a, a shipbuilding, among other things, uh, a company up in Beverly. When the, uh, they had their f first child, only child, and the boy passed away at an early age, her doctors said to him, you know, she's falling into, she's being far too morose for too long, grief-stricken, get her, take her on, on one of your boats and begin to travel. And they loved travel. They, they traveled the world over and they traveled, and she then got this uh, uh, appreciation, love, adoration for art. And uh, as the years passed, she began to buy, used her husband's millions and some of hers <laughs> to buy the artwork of the ages. Uh, but in her travels, she came up with this transcendent idea and the reason why that they decided to open a museum. And that idea was art survives. Everything passes, and there's this expression, everything passes, art endures. And the civilizations, that the, the art that she bought uh, came from civil, civilizations that had long uh, ended but they endured in history because of the art they produced. And um, that's what she wanted to bring to us in Boston, in Massachusetts. America was becoming a world power in the 1870s and 1880s. And, uh, but it was all our you know, immigrant uh, families weren't that much interested in art or appreciation of art. Well, having traveled the world over, she saw what art meant to a country, and she wanted to bring that appreciation and that inspiration for art to us. I'm getting a little afield from the, but let, let me carry on. Um, when, in, so he, uh, Jack Gardner passed away 1890s. She, she said, okay, it's time to build the museum. And when it opened in 1903, like I said, it was the largest collection owned by a pri private, individual. The MFA hadn't been started uh, around the corner from the, from the Garden Museum. And, um, she, um, and she really worked hard to uh, get art that would be valuable to, the, to, the, to us as Americans. And uh, she could get it on a little bit of a, uh, of a deal. Uh, she, ha she hired a Bernard Berenson. He was a Latin school graduate, which I always find, because I'm a Latin school graduate. Uh, but he's, he spent his life in, in, in uh, I spent my life chasing three alarm fires. He spent it buying art for the Art Museum. <laughs> so, um, and, and when it opened, she uh, had uh, all of the, uh, all of the, uh, the greatest artists and, and uh, uh, thinkers and philosophers who were in Boston at the time came and they had the symphony, uh, Boston Symphony playing uh, for them as they came in. And uh, she lasted another 20 years, uh, but she established this credo for the museum. It'll be two provisos. It'll be free and Boston kids, Boston school eighth graders, all will be traipsed their way through the Gardner Museum. Now, I, I can tell you from my own experience, 90% of us were bored silly. <laughs> and you know, we're looking around, trying, when are we getting out of here? And, uh, but there were a few of us, uh, and I can tell you that for certain. My father was a uh, immigrant survivor of the Armenian Genocide, came to America in 1920. He, he, he could draw a straight line, and they sent him to art school. And he uh, would go every day to his classes at, uh, in the South End, 
and then every day he'd walk over from the South End to the museum, and he would study the art, study it, study it, because you could get so close and look at the artwork that he would be studying. This is uh, the, 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 I'm gonna show some of the 18, uh, excuse me, 13 pieces that were stolen. Uh, this is the most valuable. Uh, Vermeer's, uh, the, uh, the concert. Uh, Vermeer uh, legend, you know, uh, uh, considered uh, one of the greatest artists who lived. Uh, and um, he did about 35 or 36, if any hard historians, you can correct us, correct me. But um, in this one uh, hung on the second floor, uh, Dutch room. It was one of the 13 pieces it was stolen. What most people know uh, who have any understanding of art is this painting here. This is Christ, is, is what I find most um, captivating. But again, I, did not, I don't have my father's eye. Um, uh, it, it is Christ in the storm of the Sea of Galilee, uh, Old Testament, uh, excuse me, New Testament uh, uh, scene described in the New Testament. And what people liked about it was this Christ here, and his, when you see it close, his face is total repose. And all of his disciples in one state of panic or another. In Rembrandt, this is the only time Rembrandt painted the ocean, painted the sea. And I like to think of it, um, oh good. Uh, I like to think of it is because he, he got it. He hit it, he was right on the mark, right on the, right on the, uh, right on the, the screws. And up top there, hope. And like I say, he loved this painting so much, he painted himself in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, so let, me, let me see if I can get that right. Hold on one second, sorry. Oh, but yeah, maybe it's right, okay. So um, there were two large Rembrandts stolen. This is one of them, and like I said, it's the only time he painted the sea. And uh, this is another, a uh, lady and gentleman in, in black. Um, they were uh, a more traditional Rembrandt pose. And um, it was stolen, they, both of them, uh, all three of those, with a couple of others, were stolen from the Dutch room uh, on the second floor of the museum. And I see a few of you nodding, you, if you've been to the museum now, of late, allow me, let me jump ahead because I think it's, a, it's an important idea. I'll go back into this as all, whoopsie. This is all, this is part of my talk, part of my talk. <laughs> um, the, when you go into the museum, you go into that room now where it had the masterpieces of the ages and you see um, you see what it looks like now. I like to, I, I acquaint it with being the first person at a, there it is, there, the first person at a wake. That there is where the Rembrandt um, Sea of Galilee, and this is, this on the other side is the Vermeer. Um, and to think of it uh, being lost, these probably the most important possessions. I know Green Monster is an important possession. <laughs> you know, I know the Bobby Orr statute is, you know, bring tears to our eyes. But, uh, but this, we owned. She bought it for us to open our eyes, to get us to appreciate art. And uh, that to me, to go back to my original point of, of uh, this was taken from us, that to me is the way to solve this case. And that, how do you do that? Well, the summer I was right, I was feverishly writing my book, and I was not on the beach, and I was not on Manomet Beach, my favorite place to, to spend summer afternoons. Uh, I was down in my hovel of a, of a basement, banging away on the typewriter, and I said, um, you know, how do I convey the importance? Uh, because the FBI has worked diligently, the gardener has put a $10 million um, uh, a reward for the recovery, and that hasn't gotten, you know, that hasn't gotten a, a, a single piece. How do you get this thing? And the summer of 2014 was the summer that all of our kids 
were pouring ice buckets over their head for the ice bucket challenge. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they were doing that for a very important cause. Raise money for ALS research. In that research drive raised $80 million in two months. July and August of 2014 raised that, and it has now raised uh, like a half a billion. And just to get aside, and, and the reason why I called the fellow who was behind the promotion, it was a BC, and he was a BC grandfather. His son had, grandson had contracted this, that dreaded disease. And I said, I knew him from the Globe. And I said, uh, Jerry, what, what's the deal here? Who, who's doing your prom promotion? He says, it's, it's him, it's my grandson, and he's online, and they, they, he and another fellow just came up with this idea. And, it, and I thought to myself, this is the way, it's social media. It's having a campaign to get all of us involved. And the way I put, I would put in front of these, and I'm gonna get to the theft, stay with me, gonna get to the juicy parts. <laughs> How to get the $10 million? When I talk to my daughter's class, she says, Dad, don't go too far away from the $10 million award. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they're here for. <laughs> but uh, I would put, uh, and he's willing to do it, but the museum hasn't gone for it yet, Cardinal O'Malley. Not the FBI, not the, uh, not the museum. You know, we're all from the have part of, I think. There are the have-nots, and the have-nots know the secrets. And so we've got to convince the have-nots to come up with the, to feel obligated to, uh, to, you know, to ask a few questions and find out where it might be hidden. And I would say to have Cardinal O'Malley say the importance of this artwork to us, our city, and have, you know, she put them on the wall for us. And when they're not there, our grandchildren don't see them. We might have seen them. You know, my father dragged me up there to see these kids when I was a kid. And I went with my eighth grade class, but I'm, you know, this is a, this is a sin, this is a spoiling. And if we're going to be, you know, we're a city of champions. And if we're gonna feel proud about that title, we gotta get this back. Yeah. We feel that obligation for, for us. So let me, let me go with how the, how the bad guys did get involved here. What happened was in, um, what happened was uh, two men showed up in, in, in um, police uniforms uh, around one o'clock in the morning on March 18th, 1990. And these are what they look like. The museum had, uh, after Mrs. Gardner's death in 1920, mid-1920s, the museum went into sort of, a, I mean, she was a sprightly woman. Uh, she didn't really care about the politicians of Boston, like she didn't read that part of the paper. She cared about the finer things and the Red Sox. That's, that's, a, that's, that's a woman who has my interest. She, um, it, but when she, after she passed away, she required, nothing could change in the museum. It had to stay as it was. There cannot be any, let's move uh, the, the uh, the art from this room and move it to that room. Do I need a microphone? Oh, I'm sorry. Do I, oh, I'll, I'll stay here. This this works. Okay. Okay. Ah, uh, sorry. Uh, so um, she um, so the, they sort of sat on their hands when it came to fundraising, and they didn't. You know, you've been on raising money for good causes. Uh, been on nonprofits, uh, uh, feed the hungry, house the poor. You're on those boards to raise money because you've got a, an important uh, responsibility. Well, these men, the, they were men uh, uh, who were on the board of trustees after her death, they didn't need to raise any money because the museum was built. It was stocked with the greatest art in the world. So they didn't really have to go out and raise money to for new um, presentations. And as a result, the museum itself began to f fray, I like to say. And uh, by the mid 20th century, uh, they hired their first security uh, uh, chief. And uh, he came to work and he said, my first summer I realized 
we didn't have central air conditioning. And the paintings were beginning to sweat during the mornings. So he says, that's not good for, you know, uh, uh, masterpieces. So I went to the board and I said, we need a half a million dollars. And they went for that. They, they raised money and they, I went back to them the next year. This is he talking to me. And he said, we need a fire alarm system. And that's going to cost another 50. And they said, we don't have it. We don't have the money. You have to raise it yourself. And he went out and raised it himself. But that showed the museum was more becoming threadbare. Uh, by the mid 20th century. And um, he feared that there would be a, uh, a fire that would get out of control or a freeze of the pipes would burst. Uh, so he was worried. And uh, they got to some of the, the security pieces, but they didn't address the security guards. The security guards, for the most part, were making minimum wage, which was really below $5. Uh, an hour, and um, and they were ragtag, and uh, the on March 18th, 1990, at one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, 1:30 in the morning, these two men, and there there are only two, uh, but those are the same men in, in the bottom two, but without the fake mustaches, <laughs> they had fake mustaches, and they rang the doorbell, the side door of uh, of the museum. And uh, there were two men on duty. One was a rock and roller who just last two weeks ago passed away, Rick Abbott. And um, Rick knew that he's not supposed to answer the, anybody comes to the front door during your shift, overnight shift, uh, he would go on at midnight and work until seven in the morning. If anybody, come, the handbook says, anybody comes to the door, rings the bell, tell, you call the police and get the police there yourself. So Rick, and I, I had long interviews with Rick, um, and I said, well, why did you go to the door and let them in, hit the release button? And he said, I thought they were some hoodl uh, hoodlums, some kids, hooligans. Uh, remember, this is the few hours after our uh, sacred holiday of St. Patrick's Day. And you know, St. Patrick's Day, the kids are out and they're doing hooliganism. Hooliganism, that's even my generation doesn't use that, but the, the, you, you know what I'm talking about, they're just screwing around. <laughs> and and he, uh, he said, that's what I thought, that some kids might have jumped in. He said, I had already done a tour. He had gone through the entire museum, four stories, had gone out back. He knew no one was out there. No, no one, there was nothing going on that was problematic. But he thought some kids had jumped over the back fence and were in the back, back area uh, of the museum. Not inside, but in the back. So he said, That's, they must have been alerted by someone. Uh, the, the police must have been alerted. So they're there. And they, they're in, police. I, they had a closed circuit TV um, a system at, at the museum. I could see them. The two, they were in police uniforms. That's what they look like. And so what am I supposed to do? And I said, well, you're supposed to follow the handbook. Well, you know, everybody has their way of doing things, and I did it my way. So he hits the release button, and these two guys come in to, to his desk. Uh, and the desk looks something like this. Let's see, sorry. Maybe I did away with that desk. Yeah, here's the desk. So Rick is standing here. This is the back of the security desk here. And this is an old timer who was supposed to work that night, but wasn't. And Rick has, this is a motion detector um, monitor. And Rick is standing here. And the two men, two police officers, come in from up here. And they stand where this old timer is standing him. And they say to him, uh, who else is here? And Rick says, uh, there's one other night watchman. He's doing the rounds. So call him down. So Rick has a two-way radio, calls the second uh, night watchman down. And he, uh, before he comes into the room, it's about two minutes or three minutes for him to come down. They say to Rick, uh, Rick, you look familiar. We don't have a, an arrest warrant out for you, do we? And Rick says, uh, no, no, no. Rick had not, was not from Massachusetts. 
He had only been in Boston for about that point two years. Um, and, uh, you know, as I'll show you a photo of Rick here. I mean, Rick could be taken for, mistaken for a, a, a hooligan. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Rick, um, but Rick swears he didn't have any record, he was not wanted, but they said, well, come around from behind that desk and come out to where we can get a good look at you, because we don't, we, we, you do look like somebody we are looking for you, not for tonight, but just for another crime. So Rick says, to, to my interview with me, he says to me, uh, I said, well, why did you follow their instructions? He said, well, I know by following their instructions. I, right away, I knew this was not the right thing for me to do. And because uh, to go back to the desk, the museum only had only one alarm, and that's right here. Only way Rick could have called the police throughout the museum was hit that alarm. There's no other way. So to remove him from behind there and to come out here, he knows he is uh, abdicating on, um, on and sending out an alarm to the world. And I said to Rick, Rick, why then did you do it? He said, I, I knew, I knew I was stepping away from the alarm. I said, why? And uh, take him, this is now 15 years ago, he points to his breast pocket. He said, I had a ticket to that night's Grateful Dead concert in Hartford, Connecticut, and I didn't want to lose it. And when I said, I heard, when, when Rick told me that, I'd, I was the first person, and I, really the only person until I handed him over to CNN, that Rick would talk to me for 10 years. He didn't like one of my articles that I wrote in 2013, saying he's done all these suspicious things, and he's never been questioned, they questioned him the next week. Um, he, he didn't like that, so he broke, he broke up broke off his relationship with me, but I, I still don't know. And he took the secret to his death. My, my sense is, you know, my feeling is that, uh, that Rick didn't give it up purposefully. He passed two lie detector tests. He's good, smart kid. Um, but he smoked so much dope. He was so um, under the influence. They had a New Year's Eve party at the museum he, three months before, New Year's Eve 1990. He invites 10 of his friends in, and he mixes up a concoction of mushroom soup or something, and they're all under, uh, under the influence. And Rick said, you know, I sort of woke up at 2 a.m. and I said, oh, Jesus, what have I done? I, I shooed them all out. Then another friend comes at 4 a.m. Rick was irresponsible. No way he should have been having that responsibility in charge of the museum. And, um, uh, and Holly said that she was getting to that, attending to that issue of the night watchmen or the guards not being quality people, not being professionals, uh, but had not gotten to it. She had just taken over six months before. Um, and uh, this theft to the security chief, to, to the other people, hardworking people, uh, who cared about the museum, loved the art, felt honored to work there. They were all, um, they were all done in by Rick's uh, negligence slash suspiciousness. And I, to this day, said, no way Rick did not do this without, um, without some involvement. My sense is Rick was a rock and roller. He had a band that uh, played some of the night, CD and nightclubs in Boston, a couple in, in Brighton. And my sense is, and I got, as I did my work into the, trying to figure out who did it, um, uh, I got to meet with some bad guys. And I learned that the bad guys knew of the vulnerability of the museum, of this museum, because they're night watchmen. And most of the museums were locked up tight and nobody was working during the day, uh, during the night, excuse me. But this one was the sole one that had night watchmen. And uh, they, I guess they didn't realize. My sense is though that someone might have met up with Rick and Rick was, uh, he was always grousing, always griping. And uh, we need to have more equipment, security equipment. 
Um, and I think he may have said that at, to the wrong people at the wrong place. And, um, and Rick did not deny that he was, you know, he was rubbing elbows with anybody who could sell him marijuana or cocaine. So my sense is that maybe he gave out a secret. Or maybe he, he, he fell for a wink in the nod. Um, you know, don't, I don't want to speak now ill of the dead, so I won't, I won't go on about Rick. But um, he, he, these two, they tie the two night watchmen up, they bring him downstairs, and then they spend another hour and not more than an hour inside the museum. And then I started to figure out why, you know, this was when I got it was on, it was 10 years ago. Why would you do this? Why? You can't sell a Rembrandt. It's not like uh, have putting on a, 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 a Vermeer. Uh, there's no way. It's not, first, it's stolen, and no one is going to buy it from whomever you're selling it to. So I said, well, maybe it's a Mr. Big. Maybe there's some criminal enterprise uh, 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 controlled by an art appreciator, and he or she wants to put the art on the walls. And, um, but as I dug into the, how they stole the artwork, I left, I let that go. And this is what I'm talking about. That's uh, a Boston police detective the next day going through all of the paintings. They, they stole about five, the major, they, the major work they took from the, the Dutch room. And um, all of the gla glass fronts were smashed. The frames were broken. And in the two large Rembrandts, the one at his backside and the one to his left, uh, they were, the Rembrandts were box, with box cutters cut out of their stretchers. And then it hit me, if I'm gonna commission these ragtag hooligans to, to, to steal, to try to steal the art of the ages, I don't want this artwork coming back to me damaged. So there had to be some other reason for this theft. And as I dug deeper into the, uh, in my, my work at the Globe was not, didn't do organized crime. We had terrific Kevin Cullen, Shelley Murphy, they didn't, they didn't need Steve Kirkson uh, to do organized crime. I did political and white collar crime. So, um, but as I d delved into it, I got to be chummy with uh, the bad guys. And understand this theft took place at a critical time in Boston's criminal underworld. The Angelo family, which had controlled Boston uh, organized crime for since the 40s, had been taken down by a indictment, federal indictment in 1985. And that set off a war between two gangs, one that was close to the Angelos and another was close to a guy named Frank Salemi. Bad guy, mobster, you know. And bodies started mounting up. And um, as I learned in my reporting, both families, both crime gangs knew of the, the vulnerability that the museum was open to theft, was vulnerable to a theft. One of them was, was headed by this guy here, Vinnie Ferrara. These are just some of the sketches that were also stolen. Vinnie Ferrara is the man on the left, a handsome guy, grew up in North End, went to Latin school, uh, went to BC, Knights, smart, and he fell in the wrong, with the wrong crowd when he got later in his teens and was making a lot of money as a gangster as a racketeer. And that life lasted for about 10 years for him. And he got arrested for racketeering in November of 89. And uh, that summer of 2014 that I'm banging away on my typewriter, not getting on the beach, <laughs> what a summer, I get a call. I reached out to, I had heard Vinnie was interested in solving this crime. I couldn't figure out why. So I made, a, I made a call to his, uh, his lawyer, who was also a Latin school graduate, and I use this to give you a hint of how we do our magic. Mostly it falls right between the, you know, right between the, uh, 
uh, the, uh, the, the, the boards. But sometimes you hit upon a person who knows your name or knew your mother, or has a friend of your cousin, and, and that's what it was with this lawyer. And he was a Latin school grad, and he started chit-chatting about Latin school, and blah, 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 blah. And he says, yeah, I know Vinny's asking about this. Vinny's asking about the, about the crime, but I couldn't tell you why, and I wouldn't tell you why. But I will send me a letter, and I'll get it to Vinny. I said, okay. So uh, around late May, early June, I get a call at my home in Miniman. And, uh, and it, it, it was not my cell phone, it was my regular phone. So it has no identifier. I, I can't say, hi, Steve Kirchner. He says, uh, you're doing something on the Gardner Museum? I says, yeah. He said, I don't want to tell you my name. I said, fine, fine, fine. He said, uh, well, I want to tell you about Vinnie Ferrara, but I want to be identified as an intermediary. Whatever you want to be, just tell me what you know. He said, well, Vinnie Ferrara was in jail after being arrested in November of 89. And he was visited in jail by his best friend and his driver, uh, Bobby Donati. Bobby Donati is on the right, uh, uh, is the man on the right. I never have not been able to identify the man in the middle. But Bobby Donati has long been thought of as having been involved in the theft, but no one can figure out why. And I will tell you why. Bobby Donati pulled this off in order to get Vinnie Ferrara out of jail. And I said, well, I didn't know Vinny was in jail. He said, look it up. I'll, I'll wait for you to look it up. And I did. I said, you're right. He got arrested six months, four months before the, the, um, the, 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 he had been arrested. He was still in jail when the theft went down. And he says, right, Bobby Donati stole this, this art to get Vinny out of jail. And I said, what are, you, what are you talking about? He said, well, you don't know this because you didn't, haven't lived the life of Vinny Ferrara. But Vinny Ferrara knew that Bobby Donati believed that artwork like this, this majestic art, is a get a free pass to get someone out of jail. Get out of jail free card. What's the monopoly term? Get out of jail free. That's what it is. I said, what are you talking about? I don't know this. He said, well, you got to do your homework. So I did my homework. And my homework led me back to this guy here. Any of you who lived, who've read the papers for the last 50 years and have lived on the South Shore, that might be a familiar first guy named Miles Connor. Miles was a ne'er-do-well, but liked fine art. And uh, Miles and Bobby Donati were friends. Bobby was, you know, common criminal. And uh, Miles had a rock and roll band, and he also had uh, some luck with stealing art. One of the places they stole out of was a place up in uh, Vermont, excuse me, Maine, uh, the estate of the Woolworth family up in Maine. And uh, Donati somehow had learned, and this is something that happened in the 70s, Donati had learned that the, muse, uh, that the estate was uh, closed until the summertime. That May of 1973, Donati and, Vin, uh, and uh, Miles break in and they steal five Wyeth paintings. <coughs> Why is this important, important artist? And, um, and I got this, this part of it, I got confirmed by, uh, by Miles. They come back to Boston, and Miles, they're going to hold on to it for a year or two. Well, Miles is, he's got, uh, he's an Action Jackson guy, so he finds someone who he thinks he can fence the Wyeth paintings with. This is 1973. Uh, he's going to do a handoff, sell them to the fence in the um, shopping lot, uh, the lot of the, sh uh, the um, Mashpee shop Shopping Center. I I'm not sure exactly where it is. He was going to play in a rock and roll uh, in a bar uh, in Mashpee That's that night. That's why he had the handoff to be uh, at this Mashpee uh, the uh, parking area. Well, he gets the pa he gets the, the paintings out of his back of his trunk, and he brings it over to the to the fence, and the fence turns out to be not a fence but an FBI undercover, <laughs> and he gets arrested as he should have gotten arrested. So this is Miles being brought into uh, Dedham County, uh, Dedham uh, uh, Norfolk Superior Court for his arraignment. 
that morning, the next morning. And uh, this is where I, I'm not, I don't believe this part of the story, but Miles tells me, as I'm walking in, one of the state cops yells to me, him, you're going to need a Rembrandt to get you out of this, Miles. Puts the idea in his head. He gets bailed. He's going to come back for another hearing. And when he's bailed, he works out a scheme. I'll get my gang, and we'll go into the MFA, Museum of Fine Arts, and we steal a Rembrandt. And they do. They go in with guns, you know, and they take a Rembrandt off of the wall, and they escape. And uh, I'm not sure where he puts the Rembrandt. He tells me one of his bums in bum friends in, in Medfield had it. But another person tells me, no, it was under the, the mother of a girlfriend of one of his gang members in the North End. I like that. I like that idea. Uh, that, <laughs> that has a more smack of verisimilitude for, for, for Miles. Well, Miles is just a kid gone wrong, but he good, you know, he, he's not hurting people. He's stealing art. But why does Miles steal that painting is because he tells, waits a year, and in the winter of 74, he calls his lawyer, Marty Lepo, a great criminal lawyer, and he says, Marty, uh, tell the FBI if they'll go easy on me on my main theft uh, uh, on the Wyeth, I will go easy with them. Um, I'll get, bring them back the Rembrandt. And uh, my, uh, Lepo says to him, uh, well, I don't, I don't know what the, well, you think they'll do that? And he says, well, a state cop yelled to me, you're going to have me to Rembrandt. And I got the Rembrandt. <laughs> so Lepo shrugs his shoulders, calls the FBI, and the FBI says to, him, uh, to, to Lepo, tell him that if he has that painting, bring it back, and he can, he can explain it all to the judge. But we're not, we're not doing, carrying his water. Uh, so and that's what happened. Miles goes into, uh, into uh, the court and tells the judge. Uh, it came, I, I was able to get my hands on the painting. I gave, I gave it back, and uh, I did it as a good, uh, a good uh, gesture to return art to the, to the walls of the MFA. But I would like to, to be, get good consideration on this other theft in Maine. The judge doesn't believe, says, Eight years for Maine, eight years for the MFA. <laughs> Lepo, Lepo says, I almost passed out. He says, because he says, I thought it was a pretty good idea. But he lets him serve the term co, co, as, a one, as a one eight year sentence. Out of that, whenever I talk to the bad guys, all of them said, it's a get out of jail free card. It's a get out of jail free card. And that's why I think that what that person who wanted to be called an intermediary told me. I gave that to the FBI. I don't know if they've called in Ferrara uh, to get his version of events. I never got disputed by anybody on this account. But um, a couple of um, a couple of years ago, I got. Um, this is one more mystery I'll tell you about. This is a frame of a painting called Shea Tortoni. And that is this painting here. Shoot, I thought I had Shea Tortoni here. No, I guess I don't. Well, this fellow here came to me about four years ago, Paul Calantropo. He, is a, he was a jeweler, grew up in uh, Everett, had a jewelry building in, uh, had an office in the jewelry building uh, in Boston. And he tells me on the record, which means that's a pretty big step to be on the record. Most people in, on, in these stories are off the record, or want to be on background or an intermediary. And, but Calantropo was willing to be on the record. He says that three months, two months after the theft in 1990, Donati came into it. He knew Donati from growing up in Everett. Donati came into his office uh, in the in the uh, uh, in the jeweler's building and took it was, uh, something he was holding was a like a white uh, uh, cloth was on top of it. 
took the white cloth off, and it was this. That is a, a finial. And do we have flag, no, this. It, most flag poles will have a finial. Most of them are round, but some of them are like this. But this finial is truly exquisite. This flag pole in that held this banner here. And it's a Napoleonic banner. That was carried by Napoleon in, uh, in, in, uh, in the Russian campaign. So this is valuable piece. They wanted to, the, the thieves wanted, this is not in the Dutch room, this is in a sh called the short gallery. Uh, it's one, uh, one room away from the Dutch room. And they wanted to get the tapestry, but they couldn't get at it. Let me see if I have a photo of it. Uh, they could, yeah, there it is there. And this is the morning after. So you see that the, 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 I can't see it, at the top, just where the light wood shows, there's a, that's where the finial was. And um, they wanted to get the tap, they wanted to get that banner. And the banner was held in place by eight small screws. They got six of the screws out. They didn't get the other two. And um, so they go up on a little settee. They got a little bureau there. They jump up on there, and they take the finial. And then they come down from there, and they get, they come upon, um, they come upon um, one frame that has five, uh, Degas sketches, and they smash that. Let me see if I get that. Now, th 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 this here is the Shea Tortoni. So let me, this is the final anecdote. This painting by Manet, which two people have come up to me in my years of talking about this, and they've said to me, Steve, that's not that's a different painting than the other paintings that they stole. That's not a grandiose painting. That's a more personal painting. There's a reason why someone wanted that for a different reason than get out of jail free. So, well, what do I know? I don't know anything. So I say, uh, well, that's interesting because the room that that was stolen out of, first floor, Everything else was in the second floor. The museum had what is called the motion detector uh, equipment that was registering the, 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 um, the sensors within the door jams of the entry and exit out of every, uh, of every gallery. And um, this was in a, a room ca called the uh, Blue Room. And th the motion detector equipment and transcript it doesn't show anybody being in the blue room. The last person who had been in the blue room that night of the theft was Rick, the rock and roller. So it has raised in my mind and continues to raise. Why didn't that, if the bad guys went in that room to go for the man A, why aren't there footsteps showing up on the transcript? And that's what this. Uh, that's what this is. That, uh, the, the tr that's the machine there. Let me see if I can pull it up. Yeah, yeah, there it is. There it is. That's the. This is the. This is the transcript. March eighteenth, five minutes or two. Someone's in the Dutch room. Someone's in the Dutch room. Some say someone in the short gallery. None of them say someone's in the blue room because maybe no one was in the blue room, but that painting was stolen. And while every other frame of every other piece that is stolen is left exactly where the, it had been hanging, the Dutch, the, uh, excuse me, the, um, the Manet frame was left on the chair of the security director. That is it. Right in Rick's, behind Rick's office, where Rick was. So, and to me, 
You know that old expression? <laughs> that, he, he, Rick did not have a, a perfect relationship with them. So, you know, um, you, uh, Rick, we wrote about uh, Rick in a sort of a um, positive way that he had worked hard and there was trouble that he had been somehow implied that he had been involved in this theft. Well, he, would, he told me any number of times, I know why people th think of me suspicious. Uh, and, I, and he said twice that he had passed lie detector tests. So uh, I'm still not convinced that <laughs> Rick uh, didn't take with him now to the grave uh, a secret. So, um, you know, all, all this time later, uh, we've, if you haven't seen the four-part series that's been on Netflix, uh, called This is a Robbery. Uh, I, I'm a little bit, um, uh, you know, a little bit back and forth on telling my story, uh, which is um, which is too bad because the story is such a powerful story. And again, it says so much about us, so much about the Hevs, that they would let this beautiful artwork be so vulnerable and it should say something about us that we would do anything we can to, um, and the museum's tried. They have a, a security director who has worked that valiantly on the case. Um, they have put a $10 million reward. Again, $10 million, my daughter will say. <laughs> so so, um, so it, it, it's an extraordinary story. I think, yet, People don't know it. I would want it to be made into a movie. It would be good for my bank account, but, <laughs> but also because this story is, says so much about the haves and the have-nots. And Boston has changed. We are not the city we were in 1990. With omerta, you know that expression, hush, hush, you don't say anything, don't say anything. Omerta is no longer part of our, you know, if you see something, you say something. And uh, that, uh, so much of that changed with what happened in 2000, 2013 with the Marathon bombing and how Boston sort of rallied to the victims and trying to catch the bad guys. Um, that's what I would like to be, have happen here. And I, but the only way to do it is to promote it. I'm promoting it as best I can, but I would like them to start this social media campaign and do it. Like I said, the Cardinal is willing to do it, but... Um, I haven't gotten any callbacks from the FBI of, of late, so. Mm -hmm.